Now, we've been in a 150-year uh, gradual slide into thinking about mental health using the metaphor of illness and health, with frankly more focus on illness than health. And I'm not against medications. I've taken mental health medications myself. Their entire school systems, or half the kids, are on methylphenidate, Ritalin, or Adderall, or something. Could I tell a personal story? Please. My son is about to turn 18. When he was uh, th three years old or so, we had him tested because it was odd. He, he couldn't cut his meat. He, he couldn't hold on to a pencil properly. He, he couldn't do a single sit-up. He couldn't hang on to the monkey bars. My son's lifelong trajectory would have been tilted towards all kinds of problems that could easily show up as drug problems, anxiety problems, mental health problems, et cetera. So if you're listening, it's not too late. And there are skills that we know scientifically can give you that mental flexibility, strength, and endurance. Do put these flexibility skills into your life. And if you want to be a high performer, do it that way. Dear listeners, this show is brought to you by Freeletics. Building a fitness routine took my life to a new level. Energy, confidence, health, feeling good about my body, staying young and agile. But most of us find it enormously difficult to build such a routine. The motivation is lacking, the workouts feel bad, the plan doesn't adapt, the success doesn't materialize. But it is possible to be healthy, fit, and enjoy your life. Because I certainly did not want to be held hostage to a fitness routine or feel that I am somehow missing out on life just to be fit. For those willing to invest a few minutes of their day to develop a determined lifelong workout routine, Freeletics offers a simple lifestyle, personalized workout plans, and data-driven insights to maximize your likelihood of success while having fun. Start now at freeletics.com. Also, this show is sponsored by Stadia. The scientifically proven benefits of training with weights are indisputable. For the major physiological systems in your body, such as muscle size, strength, athletic performance, functional capacity, also for the increase in bone density, and the improvements in cardiovascular, cognitive, and psychological health. Working out with weights is almost a magic bullet. And now you can have all of these benefits at home. Stadium offers you high quality, stylish weight training equipment that you will love to have lying around your place. Get it at stadium.com. Thank you for supporting the show and checking out our sponsors. And now, let's start with the conversation. Welcome to This One Life. Today on the show, Dr. Stephen Hayes. Stephen is a professor of psychology at the University of Nevada, the author of 47 books, almost 700 scientific articles, and one of the most cited psychologists in the world. His work has been focused on developing a new behavioral science approach called contextual behavioral science, and he's the originator of acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT. Stephen, welcome. I'm very, very happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. You said we need to change how society broadly thinks and talks about mental health. Can you explain that? Yeah, we've been in a 150-year uh, gradual slide into thinking about mental health using the metaphor of illness and health, with frankly more focus on illness than health. Uh, but really, we're talking about how you bring your skills into living your life, and that isn't just mental. It also means, so what about your relationships? What about your performance? What about your business? You know, what about the 
community that you belong in, et cetera. So really what we're talking about are what are the skills that help you deal mentally with the challenges that you face in life to expand that out into your physical health, your physical body, your you know being in the world and to social wellness and social engagement. So it's mental and behavioral and social wellness, all of that. And it's not that you're to be pushed inside a little category of five out of nine or four out of seven and you have it or you don't. And when you do that, one out of five people walking around, you could probably give them a diagnosis of a mental disorder. You know, after we've been through the pandemic, everybody knows that it's not one out of five, it's five out of five. Out of five. And it's not like one hour a week you do therapy any more than it's, you know, one hour a week you, you care about your body. It's 24-7. So how do we get to a five out of five, 24-7 mindset that is really focused on the mental resilience skills that you need to be able to live a vital and connected and meaningful life? And if you focus on it that way, mental health gives you a lot of guidance to everything you want to do in your life and stop compartmentalizing it. Let what we know about how change happens enter into your day-to-day -day life. Is Does that mean that what you are um, arguing for is that we should not look at mental health from a perspective of um, somebody is severely ill, um, but um, hey, all of us, we all would benefit from working on our mental health. You don't need to have a huge problem um, uh, or feel terrible or anything like that. There's room to grow, to feel better, to be more happy, to be a better person in, in all of us. Yeah, I think what has happened was we bought into a uh, cultural conversation about what you have instead of what you do, which actually seems destigmatizing superficially. But when you go in and you say, I'm right, this is happening, this is happening, this, and they say, oh, well, you have this disorder. Yeah, a disorder is not a disease. It's just a collection of signs and symptoms, things you complain of, the things that people outside you can see. And the reason that practitioners, physicians, the medical community that adopted that when it happens in physical disease is so that you can get to what is the underlying etiology? Where did it come? What is the underlying course? How does it change over time? And how can I make that, understand that more mechanistically? And then uh, response to treatment, how do things change and why do they change? Then you have a disease. You know how many of these so-called disorders over the last 40 years have gone from syndromes, just mere collections, to diseases? The answer is zero. None. Many, 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 many billions of dollars spent. It would be like going to your physician and say, you know, I've got a rash here, look, and I don't know where it comes from. He said, oh, you've got idiopathic dermatitis. And you say, oh. I've got idiopathic dermatitis. What does that mean? It means you have a rash and we don't know where it comes from. You know, come on. If, if you can't after 40 years and billions of dollars, have you been one success story? The last success story was general paresis, which is when you have syphilis and you don't treat it. Almost nobody listening to me right now has untreated syphilis nor have I ever met a clinician who has such a case. And that's the last one. But at the kitchen table, we we're saying, oh, you know, Uncle Fred was diagnosed as having an anxiety disorder and Susie has ADHD. And, yet, you know, there's a, hundreds of thousands of different ways to be categorized at ADHD. And every single person is different. Can I, I'll give you an example, major depressive disorder, very common kind of thing. And it's part of the common cold of my field, psychology, psychiatry. 
one of the last really, really big randomized trials, multi-site, 3,700 people in it, called the Stardy trial. I say one of the last because the federal government, people don't understand this, have given up on this vision. It's just that the people out there in the community are still uh, singing the same song, but the scientists are, are, have given up on what I've described and they have a different way forward. Uh, 3,700 people in this trial. How many different collections of signs and symptoms? Almost 1,100 out of 3,700. In other, how many people had a pattern that was so unique? It was only 100th of a percent or a little above that was the same pattern as you after that. Almost half. I mean, if you, if you went into surgery and you say, well, I've got this problem, I need surgery. And they said, yeah, but you know, you're one of several thousand different types and that could really matter. And we're not going to assess it and tell you what it is, but we know that you have a problem there. So we're just going to do the surgery. You'd say, well, can you do a better diagnosis than that? You know, and in physical health, we know to go and try to get a more personalized approach. You know, what are my unique features? You know, to ask that of your physician. Why don't we do that in this area? So when you do that, how it doesn't mean the problems. I'm not being Pollyanna here. Go away. It means let's dig, dig down to the why question. What are the actual processes that we know about that are pulling us down or lifting us up? And almost everybody, even if you're in a severe downturn, sometimes you have things that lift you up, but you don't actually notice them and know how to apply them regularly. And the things that you're doing to pull you down are sometimes things that you think would be helpful. It just turns out the science says and your experience says they're not. So uh, I think we need a different vision of let's focus on what we do, on the processes that lift us up or push us down. Focus on problems, yes. Um, but let's hold off on the big categorical concepts that look like they're destigmatizing, but immediately once you adopt them, you start selling yourself short. You say, I don't, you know, I can't because I have this. Boy, that and your family member does family members do the same thing. They think it's a kindness. That's not a kindness to sell yourself short and ask your family members to sell you short. Let's see. Just so that I make sure that I correctly under understood. So what you're saying is that, hey, in this way, in that we put labels onto people, let's take ADHD as, as, an, as an ADHD as an example. Um, we face several problems with that. One that you specifically mentioned was that diagnosis is not specifically enough to that person. And so the treatment also likely might not be the right one for the person, or at least not the ideal one for the person. That, that was one thing that I understood. The other thing is that in labeling these people, it seems that we're more open and more inclusive to them, but actually we do them something bad because um, we put them into a certain corner um, and we um, almost make them um, a victim, um, basically, of, 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 of that treatment. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that last part, we go from this idea that kindness means understanding that one out of five people have this, and we, in our kindness and pity, will treat them. That's not, it's not one out of five, it's five out of five. Do you know anybody really, really well? who hasn't had experiences that are potentially trauma-inducing for them, or that they haven't had times where they really are struggling with meaning or with motivation or with anxiety or sadness or being wrapped around judgment. or So, yeah, that last part I'm saying, uh, a real destigmatizing approach is to to really dig into the common humanity that connects us all and to show up to, it's hard to be human. We're, we're, we're kind of new at this game of dealing with this invention of language and cognition, which is only a couple hundred thousand or maybe a couple million years old, sitting atop brain structures and our body that's a thousand times older. 
And so, you know, if you buy into a view of yourself, you know, you start filtering out information. There's midbrain structures that literally won't allow you to have the sensory motor information that is there that a dog or cat could access, but you can't because I'm like this. The world is like that. You know, this, there's almost a parasite that's uh, dominated over us, what you and I are doing right now. You know, they're called mental health problems for a reason. This mental skill of being able to think in symbols and project out, you know, it ha has taken us over. And in the modern world, we're feeding it in, in a lot of negative ways. Now that, you know, that uh, kind of first part that people pull in their horizons, it, that's an empirical fact when you use labels like that. So uh, let me give an example. You said ADHD. I have a kid who has ADHD. You just say that, and I'm not. I have family members who are in that category, and I I'm, so I'm not saying it with a sneer. I'm, that's not what I mean. I, I'm trying to point to a common pattern. The immediate place our mind goes, if I have a condition, a mental health condition, a mental illness, I must need medication. I mean, it must be, it's built into me. It's, it's, it's how I was born. It's, 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 in, it's in my body. It's in my brain. Okay. There's no specific biomarkers for ADHD that are sensitive and specific, nor for anti, any of the so-called mental health disorders that we have. If there were, they'd be turning into diseases. And this is not me saying that. This is the American Psychiatric Association and their DSM-5 work group. Word for word, there are no specific and sensitive biomarkers for any psychiatric syndrome. So don't be sending emails saying, uh, I'm mischaracterizing it. And so when you think, oh, I th it's something I have, of course, medications would come to mind. And I'm not against medications. I've taken mental health medications myself back in my own history, and I've done randomized trials on how to get clinicians who are too rigid about that to loosen up a little bit and do it when it's appropriate. But their entire school systems, or half the kids, are on methylphenidate, Ritalin, or Adderall, or something, right? And then you follow them out, and, and at adulthood, they're an inch shorter. The effect sizes on calming down the kind of ADHD that leads children to have a hard time focusing in classes can be centered down. Yeah, but the effect sizes, the actual impact of meds by three years out is close to zero because your body starts adjusting to it. And why is it that the likelihood of being diagnosed as that kind of ADHD is very much higher if you just happen to be born one week after the cutoff for which grade you're in in school. That's a funny biological disorder. Well, it's some new magically that September 1 was the cutoff date. <gasps> no, it's because the young kids, of course, have a hard time doing what we ask children, young children to do, which is insanity. Sit in your desk, put your, your, your hands on. And it, are you kidding me? Were you ever eight years old? What are you asking children to do that for? Rearrange your classrooms, you know, figure out a way to let children be children. So the side effects of this way of thinking is that we're shoving people into categories that are ill-fitting suits without really looking carefully at their unique lives. And then we sell them short. And then and it's very difficult for them to ever get out of the category again. Uh, could I tell a personal story? Please. My son is about to turn 18. When he was uh, th three years old or so, we had him tested because it was odd. He, he couldn't cut his meat. He, he couldn't hold onto a pencil properly. He, he couldn't do a single sit-up. He couldn't hang onto the monkey bars. He was three, three and a half. The things young kids would do, you know, I'm trying to teach them to throw and catch a ball. And my goodness, it'd be like 
throwing it at a cardboard cutout. You know, I mean, you almost didn't even see the ball. It would hit him in the face. It would be like, what? What's going on? We had him test it. One percent on all these tests, basically unmeasurable. He was so weak uh, that they, they couldn't even categorize it. And he had some uh, others' physical features. So they said, okay, he's got a genetic disorder, I'm told. He will never be strong. He will never be able to team sports. He will never be good at anything physical. The kind thing that you could do is get him something, take him out of the soccer class, which, you know, when, when he played soccer, oh my gosh, you know, he was so slow. And so it was just like, if they ran from one end of the field to the other, you would have to like go to sleep before he'd finally get to the other end. Okay, we put him into martial arts, mixed martial arts, because and found a kind teacher. And he would say, I'm committed to black belt excellence, man. And I would sit there with all the parents and part of me thinking, I know what a black belt test includes. This will never happen, son, but I'll humor you and pretend. Well, he comes up to around 13. And he, now it's time for the black belt. He's been there so long now. He's way behind the other kids. But his teacher says, I'm going to get him in with an Olympic level coach, Max McNanus, who David Wise, the half cap, half piper, oh, uh, you know, got, a, I think, a, a silver in the last Winter Olympics, a gold in the one before that came from Reno, David Wise. Anyway, well, his strength and conditioning coach, Max McManus, um, picked him up within two weeks. I'm going home and I'm so mad. I'm telling this story, what the physical therapist said and what the pediatrician said. And he says, I don't give an F about that. Let's see what he can do. And he's challenging my 13-year-old with things like, I don't think he can do this. You can't jump that high. Make another try. You know, no, you can't. Okay, you did that, but you're not going to be able to do this. And he's using weird motivation exercises I've never seen before, playing mixing a kind of humor and pushing and challenging and within a couple of weeks he's very noticeably stronger well he got his black belt he teaches at the dojo he's doing his second black belt coming up this january you know and i just went home and just kicked the trash cans in damn it with all of my emphasis on the individual and don't put people in categories, I did it to my own son. I sold him short. Look, here's the dirty secret, all those bell curves and standard deviations that say, oh, you're at this percentile. They mathematically do not predict your future. You've been told they do. It's a statistical lie. I've been on a journey to un try to understand why they don't predict. And I think I understand it now. And we have a entirely new statistics that work a lot, a lot better when you measure within the person over time. Pretty geeky place to go. But let me just say it this way. Uh, the statistical, phys statistical physics in the 1800s figured out why knowing what your percentile is can't predict your future. Because it's comparisons between people. It's not within. You need to know what are going on within you to know your future. And then what are you, how are you going to deploy those skills? If you can do that in a complex part of a complex system, you can, you can manage. You can evolve your life on purpose. So Stevie evolved his life on purpose because of a loving black belt teacher, Michelle Weaver, and a magnificent strength and conditioning coach, Max McManus, changed his life. I mean, he's a more confident, social, et cetera, because now he goes and he can do, you know, arm wrestling with his friends and sometimes win. He can, uh, you know, teach some kids who are afraid, you know, how to punch in a way that uh, will meet the requirements of his uh, martial arts uh, tradition. You know, he's an epistolation of respect. And no, he's not the strongest even now. And he work, has to work three times as hard for the other ones to be able to do what you need to do as a black. But he's done it. And he can do it. 
And if you're listening right now and you're, you've been told you have to live inside a box by some normative category, it's time to kick down the walls of the box. And let's see. And uh, I think the work on psychological flexibility and mental resilience gives you a guide. I'm sorry for the long answer, but uh, it's a, a painful and meaningful part of my life to see how easily I succumbed to what's in the water in our world that has limited horizons of millions of people. Wow. So, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that your, your, your son is a, a lot better. And I want to thank you for sharing that story. Um, that, that means a lot to me, Stephen. If, if you may, um, what do you think would have happened to a comparable case like your son if, um, in that case, um, you know, the, 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 the kid would not have had the fortune of running into such a coach and would had have parents that might have been much more um intimidated by the, the 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 label or you know the diagnosis um of 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 the doctor well you can't give me a pass on that last part i was as intimidated and so was my wife we both kind of say oh that was a mistake thankfully thankfully there were people who were wiser than what the medical establishment and the normative bell curves said, and my son found a way out. And the dynamic effect that I mentioned is he's socially confident in ways that he never, ever would be. He used to hide in the closet when people came to the door because he was so shy and afraid and felt so inadequate and nobody wanted to play with him at, on the schoolyard. Think about what it's like. And, you know, children with disabilities face this. People who have disfigured face this. Ethnic minorities face this. I mean, it's everywhere. Look around you, you know. And so I think what, what would have happened is the cascade that happens from that of this feeling of social inadequacy that then gets deeply embedded. And the where Stevie, I, I think you won't mind me saying, his shyness and social withdrawal, he never would have had the opportunity of what happened when he actually then got his black belt and Michelle, the head of the dojo, asked him to be a teacher because she could see how kind he was and how hardworking he was and, and, and how committed he, he was to the work. And the effect of that is when he has kids, he has to go over and introduce himself and he has to go to the parents and say hello and shake their hand and say, well, now... If somebody comes to our house, you know, I've got this. I mean, he was always a wonderful boy and stuff, but I've got a, a wonderful young man who comes over and shakes their hand and looks him in the eye and say, hi, welcome. How are you doing? Oh, nice to meet you. And just normal social things. Oh, my goodness. That may not have happened. And I don't know what that would mean, but my guess, social anxiety disorder. It's not social anxiety disorder. There's no disorder like that. Well, you could say it. I don't want to minimize. I've had that label myself and panic disorder. I understand it from the inside out. And no, what you have are, are you don't have the skills to show up to your anxiety inside your yearning to be liked and included and part of the group. And so you withdraw because then it soothes that anxiety. It also means you don't then have the opportunity to learn by trial and error how to be part of the group. It also means you're outside of the group. Even if you get in, you kind of all, always afraid you're going to be thrown out. If they really knew who I was, they won't like me. If they, so you put on a false face, then they know if I saw through my false face. I did. It's a cascade. It's a system. So what would have normally happened, I think? If it wasn't the miracle of Michelle and Max, my son's lifelong trajectory would have been tilted towards 
all kinds of problems that could easily show up as drug problems, anxiety problems, mental health problems, etc. And of course, he may still have those things in his future. I'm not saying that. That's not Pollyanna. But it's a system. If you're in the gym, if you're working on your physical strength and so forth, you know you need flexibility. You need strength. You need endurance. How do you bring our mental properties into that and not treat it like, you know, my body is broken? No, you, you get in there and you work in the gym. You see how much you can do. And you don't do it one hour a week. You do it regularly over time. And you don't wait until your body's breaking down and say, oh, I guess now that I'm 70, I need to go to the gym. Too late. So if you're listening, it's not too late. And there are skills that we know scientifically can give you that mental flexibility, strength, and endurance. And time's up. If your life matters, your evolution matters, and you are in charge of that, not some category that's put atop you. Um, before going into what would be actually better ways um, how to uh, how to handle that and that might lead us towards ACT, for example, uh, first of all, what I want to say is I, um, I mean, obviously not in the scale that you have experienced it, but I can feel a lot this. It is so much easier if you don't get a label, but if you acknowledge a feeling and there's a reason for that feeling and work on it. Um, I had faces during my entrepreneurial career where likely you could have also said that that was a depression because of things, but there was just one really big thing that was very, very, very difficult for me. And in navigating and, you know, getting rid of this very difficult thing, also this, what you could have likely called a depression, uh, went away. It was one challenging aspect. But then what, you know, the question that, the, the big question that I that I have then is, uh, what is the reason then that these labels are so widely used? Um, and maybe before going into that, could you steal man a case for why you should use these labels when treating patients or people in general? I missed the first part of that. Can you? still make a case for using labels? So Steema and basically take, I, take the perspective of somebody using those labels yes. and say, why would you use those? I think the biggest reasons is because of the way we've organized our society, you sometimes need them to access care. Uh, you know, the insurance companies will refu refuse care in many countries and, uh, you know, professionals so uh, won't work with you unless they're able to do it inside some sort of diagnosis and the diagnosis is tied to a scientific tradition that goes back to Galton and his bell curves and standard deviations and the development of biostatistics, uh, you know, by the heroes of statistics like R.A. Fisher, Carl Pearson, Frank Yates, and uh, bringing that into diagnosis. Uh, the, so you need to fit inside, you know, Galton, we're talking about 50 years ago, we've developed a way of talking about our needs, and we have categories and labels that you need to talk about. But you also need to know, and an informed consumer knows this, sometimes other agendas come in. You may have agendas of a label being pushed at you because that way I can sell you something. Well, okay. The single most common measure of depression, anxiety, a screening measure used in all of psychiatry is the PHQ-9. It only came out about a month ago that this now 30 years old instrument used everywhere. It was developed by a marketer in Big Pharma, not a scientist. Why were the items written that way? You can read the items and you can see because they orient you towards, I have a thing, a condition, a latent disease. And underneath that, it's the marketers know they've done the research. If I have it and it's in my whole essence, I'm going to have to deal with it and treat it biologically. Now, there are times where you need medications. I'm not saying that, but you know, 
don't we know in this modern world, doesn't anybody know that you're being sold often? You know, just look, go on YouTube and analyze why is a person talking exactly that way and who's behind them? So be a wise consumer. And the wise consumer will say, okay, yeah, I'm going to put in my name in that channel so that I can get access to that thing. But no, I don't necessarily have to believe that all these things that, that brought me into that group or that channel or whatever is so. I'm going to be thoughtful about it. If my physician recommends something, I'm going to do a research of my own it's a, in the same way. But um, the core of the ACT message, we call it ACT, not ACT, but thank you for saying it that way because people cannot remember the words. It's called acceptance and commitment therapy or when it's used outside of therapy, acceptance and commitment training. It's the same thing. And when it's used in business and industry and so forth, same thing. Are these set of skills that focus on the single most common things that can move you forward up and out of a category? And could I just say one final thing? It's probably not where we want to go. But who are the hero? Who who are these biostatistical heroes? I mentioned their names. Uh, I mean Dawkins. Uh, uh, Selfish Gene, there's a kind of famous uh, guy that said that Ari Fisher, who was not a biologist, was the second greatest biologist who ever lived. These were, you know, Galton is a polymath that you, uh, here's your heroes. Yeah, what were they professors of? Not statistics, eugenics. Eugenics. So there, you know, and where did Galton first lay out nature and nurture? In a book called Hereditary Genius that argues that the upper classes of the UK should be the ones who have children and not everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, what leads to the Holocaust? That. Yeah, the Holocaust wiped it out. We pretend as though it never happened. Two thirds of the presidents of the American Psychological Association from 1892 to 1947 were card-carrying eugenicists. Nobody ever talks about it. I never had a course in my psychology training. It's all, you know, tape over your mouth and over your eyes and plugs in your ears. Never happened, never happened, never happened after Hitler. It did happen, and it's still here in the dirty history of the very speed that we use to categorize people and think that predicts their future. It doesn't. It's false. It's statistically false. So let's push a reset button. And I'm not the only one. You know, the uh, NIMH and others are all moving in this process direction. How do you know? You're starting to hear words like personalized medicine. Why? Because people know that these disease categories, even when they're legitimate diseases, don't really give you everything you need to know until you really know how this dynamic system called a human being works. And then we can know how to deal with that cancer better. And we're just learning how to do that statistically. Let's do the same thing with our own behavior and our skills. And the joyful message I'm lifted up by it is out of that 40, 50 years of wandering around inside Colton's eugenic dreams in psychology and psychiatry, we developed a lot of knowledge about what are the processes of change you can deploy. And I recently did a meta-analysis of every study ever had done in the history of the world, in any language, in any disorder, with any method, when they did the statistical, accepted statistical methods to determine why change happened. And we summarized it all, and I can summarize 80% of what we found in a paragraph, or maybe even a long sentence. So it's not like it's complicated. We know a lot. We've learned a lot. And uh, let's get all of the boxes that people have been shoving us in and start focusing on the, the ropes we can gra grab onto that will pull us forward in the direction we want to go. I am very curious about that sentence that's or that paragraph that's summarized. Just before we move into that, um, let me summarize 
what we have so far talked about as the need to press that what you call reset button to um, focus on personalized medicine that does not put people into certain categories, um, just puts labels on them, short sells them, and also to be aware of the financial incentives that are within every system and here um, specifically um, you know, selling you treatments and, and, and drugs. Um, but now to the actual, to the question, how can we make it better? So you just mentioned there's a, there's a paragraph, um, that, 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 that you could let us know that summarizes 80%, yeah. um, of the findings and maybe connected to that, um, then moving into act. What what yeah. is the core concept of ACT and your book, A Liberated Mind? Why don't I answer those in an upside down way? In fact, I, let me give you the challenge, I can give myself the challenge. So I will do that paragraph in a way that gives you 98% of everything we know about how change happens, validated by statistically correct mediational analysis, which is the geek thing. You don't need to know what that is, but it's not easy. It's really hard. And looking at every single study ever done in the history of the world, it took us three years, 50 people to analyze it, looking at 55,000 studies. You don't want to read 55,000 studies twice, believe me. Um, um, and it, it's based on only the findings that have been replicated at least once. So here, here's the paragraph, and then I'll answer your question about ACT. How change happens is that you need to learn to be more emotionally and cognitively flexible and come into the present moment, aware of the past and the future, but in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary from a sense of self that is not dominated by categories, but is more the kind of pure awareness that connects human consciousness to others. And then focus on what is meaningful to you in an intrinsic way, fitting it to your social and cultural context. Get your feet moving in that direction and make sure you deploy those skills also to your social relationships and to kicking care uh, of your body. The end. 98% of everything we know about how change happens is there. And your question about ACT, the first six things you may not have missed that is partitioned into six, but it was, is classical ACT. The entire model is ACT as we're trying to expand it. Why are we expanding it? Because one of the great values of thinking in terms of processes of change is that all the doors and windows are opened. Anybody has an idea out there? Come on in. You got a process? Let's really look at it. If you can nail it, we want it. I mean, you wouldn't build a house if somebody came to you and say, yeah, well, I'll build this house for you. But, you know, I only use Stanley tools. And unfortunately, only the ones that don't require electricity. But I'll build you a Stanley house. It'll take three times as long and cost five times as much. You'd say, excuse me, I think I want to find a different contractor. You know, but we have the functional equivalent of that when we go over and we want our sports coach or, or our, you know, life coach or our a therapist or, you know, to only use these methods, you know, I'm only, well, use the methods that move the processes that move the lives that accomplish the goals. And let's get off this kind of not invented here, castles in the sky, trademarked things. Everybody will remember me a hundred years after I'm, no, they won't. You don't even know your great, great grandparents' full names, all of them. Grow up, but put something into the world that will change the world. And that we can do by focusing on processes. And that's what I walk through in the liberated mind is that I walk through the science history and the personal history of how we dug down to the psychological flexibility model. And then there's the Liberated Mind Volume 2, which is not being written, but I'm writing it in this very moment. 
as we learn to expand out, include some things that I think I underestimated and underemphasized in the more purely psychological model I built. The social part of us is too important. Cultural part is too important. Physical part and body is too important. And so I'm rewriting my first big self-help book, which I sold Harry Potter for one glorious week. It was written up in time, like top five minutes of fame. I'm rewriting it. And psychological flexibility is going to mean life flexibility. It's going to mean all psychological, physical, social, and uh, will fit that paragraph that I just uh, said to you. I love the notion of working in an egoless way um, and trying to be open-minded and focus on what works independent from where it comes from and not just because it has my name um, and, I, and you know, I, I need to coin something that quote unquote, is going to be my legacy um, sometime in, 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 in life, which uh, not, we, we don't even, yeah, you, you said the name of the grand grandparents. We don't know the names of the most influential people of the, of the 19th or 20th century. Um, how do you think that anyone will remember your name? Hopefully your family remembers your name for 50 years or something like that. Um, is, Stephen, is there a way to help us understand this paragraph that you give i think you mentioned 96 percent is in there i don't know whether it was 96 percent 98 98 98 so can you help us understand is, is there a way to help um to understand that paragraph um in a maybe simplified example ideally speaking for example in the area of um you know physical health or performance how how um can help me in those areas Yeah, sure. Let's just uh, take, uh, okay, I take a study, uh, it's not published yet, that we did with uh, people doing planking. Good thing to do planks. Probably a lot of people listening to me have, have done it. And you know that it isn't too long before you have various bodily sensations that uh, impact strongly on your willingness to proceed. And the common advice, many coaches will give it, distract yourself with other things. You, you might have heard that. Uh, let's think of time at a beach or something like that. I know with my health coach, if I'm doing planking or, or a wall sits or something and, and I, the clock's getting up beyond where, what I've been able to do before, she wants to talk to me. I've asked her not to because I, I think I know I have an idea about something to do better. We did this in a randomized trial, and we actually know that this is better than that, for example. Or to focus just on the form, another calm, common coaching method. Let's really make sure that, you know, your your back is held correctly, that your your butt's not way up in the air if you're doing the plank, or that, well, I've mixed it in now with wall sits, so I've created a problem for myself telling the story. Okay, so here's what we did in our goofy trial. I'll give you two things we did, both of which I'll give you the end part. Uh, beat the pants off, what most sports coaches would say about how to extend the time. Uh, we had one condition in which people would notice the sensations that would lead them to stop. And then in their mind, not aloud because you've got to be able to breathe well, Imagine a song that they like and uh, to sing the thoughts that, that are linked to those sensations uh, in their mind. Oh, I'm really, really in a lot of pain. I'm in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Oh, I'm really, really, really in a lot of pain. I can't go on much longer. No, I can't. No, I can't. I'm really, really end up, you know, something like a 40%. I'm, I'm forgetting the exact statistics, increase in plank times. What's the underlying concept? What, what, why okay. did that happen? Because, and this is in the cognitive uh, uh, domain, this is called a diffusion skill. Diffusion, it's a made-up word. We used to call them deliteralization, and I couldn't say the word, and so we went to diffusion. But really what it is, is we're using 
methods that get you to back up a little bit from this language parasite that is commanding all of our bodily systems and peel it away so that we can notice the thought with a tiny little bit of psychological distance between this awareness part of us that's noticing and the thought that is telling us like a dictator inside our head that we have to comply with its instructions. Well, you have a lot of thoughts in your head. You have contradictory thoughts in your head. I mean, even four-year-old children understand goofy with horns on one shoulder and goofy with a halo on the other shoulder. And if you haven't lived inside the cacophony of your own mind, you haven't been listening because you've got multiple voices telling you what to do, but you're in that plank and it's telling you, you can't possibly do go longer. Oh my goodness, you have to stop. Stop now. I really, really, really have to stop now. Oh, I have to stop now. I have to stop now. We could do it not by singing. We have hundreds of these methods. We could do it by, uh, uh, you know, saying it backwards. We could do it at saying it in the voice of your least favorite politician. We could have Mickey Mouse say it. You think that's going to have the same impact on your planking? Of course it won't. Because why? It's not because you're ridiculing yourself. Don't think that these are methods of ridicule. And when I do this and explain this, there's a TED Talk. You can find it easily. Not my first one, but my second one, where I walk through 12 of these methods with uh, a school of kids who have 99.9% .9 tentile IQ scores, or they wouldn't be in the school called the Davidson Academy. And boy, do they suffer with the mental monsters controlling them because they're so good at words and it's just pushing them around constantly. No, what happens is that you can create odd contexts where words land differently. And those midbrain structures that are filtering out your sensory inf motor information behave differently. Now, if you distract yourself, I'm going to think about this. Okay, so that what will happen? So I don't think about that. A dude, as soon as you know that you're doing distraction, you just thought about that. How would you know that you're dissing the traction? Traction means a pull. Dissing means eliminating. Unless you knew what the traction was. And we're focusing on that. Do you see the problem? Have you ever tried to distract yourself from a donut? that you foolishly bought and put in the refrigerator? The very, very, very favorite kind from your very, very favorite bakery? I'm not gonna eat it, I'm not gonna eat it. I, you're not gonna eat what? The donut. The mental presence of that donut is in the dissing. In the same way that with an anxiety disorder, this is my history. This is how ACT happened. I tell that story in the other TEDx talk. You know, when I was full blown into my panic disorder, I'm still trying to treat clients. The word panic would cause me to panic. But so would the word relaxation. Eventually the word emotion. Because relaxation remind me of something. Like what? Not anxiety and panic. I don't know. What if I got panicky right here, right now? What if I ran out of this session when I'm working with my client? I would think I'm, I'm in the psychologist. I can't do that. Look. Now my heart rate's going 160 beats a minute. Look, it's not logical. It's psychological. That's why we need to learn these skills. Because your logical mind has been giving you logical alternatives. That's great when you're doing your taxes, fixing your car. It's not great when you're trying to seek out peace of mind with purpose which is your task in life. That's your task. That's your job. That's the game. Oh, well, okay. Let's start working on how to learn me as a whole organism with intuition, with a physical sense, with a history that goes back millions of years that contain, with a cultural history that contains wisdom that I don't even know. I don't know the names of those heroes that you were talking about. Yeah, but some of their ideas are in me. I have been walking through my life with my fingers in my ears. I don't remember them. I don't. 
okay, how do I connect with those skills that I know it might got move me in a direction that would be me at my best? And the fact is, you already know everything I just told you in that paragraph. You already know it. Can I give you an example of why? Please. Pick somebody in your life who has lifted you up and empowered you in some way that you admire, that you really appreciate. You know, like the Michelle and Max heroes I talked about. Or pick somebody in your life. When you were with them, did you feel as though you were really with them in that moment? Or were they looking at their watch? Did they care about what you cared about? Or did they just override your values without a second thought? Did you feel constantly judged and criticized when you were with them? Or not? When they saw you for who you are, did you feel accepted for who you are? Or was it, nah, maybe later if you do this, this, and this? Could you be together in ways that fit opportunities as a situation? Or were there's always rigidly one way, my way, their way, or the highway? And could you, when you saw opportunities in the moment, be able to pursue those things. When your eyes met, final one, did you see consciousness there? Did you see a human eyes or did you see dead eyes? And you know what I mean. People see you, but they don't even see you. Or did you felt as though you're being seen? Look, I just mentioned the six parts of the psychological flexibility model, and I know the answer to every single question I just asked. Because you picked them because they modeled how to uplift your life. And you know from your gut, from your living, that that paragraph I gave you does it. And these categories that have been shoved down your throat don't. But your mind doesn't. Because your problem-solving mind, which is only part of you, can only evaluate good and bad, pros and cons, future and past. And that part needs to be put on a leash so that you can show up to the full wisdom of your body, your history, your culture, and your experience. On everything, on all the questions that you um, that you stated, of course, as you said, my answer uh, was yes, you know, to the person and the situation that I had in my head. And you know, the the challenge that I'm now trying to work through is that if we um, if we just state or assume that, hey, there's real power in that approach. The challenge for me is that although I could say yes to the questions that you've asked me, I would not be able to replicate that or maybe replicating is the wrong word, but take that concept and apply it to an area where I'm struggling. So I, I, I'm not trained. I don't have the depth of understanding in order to apply it there. So. Um, I would love to, you know, shift gears and move into now assume we, we have talked about this. We need a reset button. We've talked about better ways in how it can work. Now, how can we make it more applicable, more impactful for the broader mass of people? And these are questions and I will, you know, I, I, I would defer to you and you choosing the order or where you want to focus on, but these are questions like, how can a person um, build their determination to start working on mental health, you know, against the stigma or, or, you know, the perceived huge hurdle, um, are there ways in, in that I can use a gradual approach or put a toe into the water? So get comfortable with the idea, feel some initial success. Absolutely. These skills can be learned. Now, here's one thing from that mediational analysis. Mediators don't work unless they change when you intervened. And because they changed, long-term outcome happens. So what I told you in that paragraph has been bedded by the 55,000 studies that said they did it, the 1,000 studies that did it right, and the 281 replicated findings that used methods of measurement that have been found by other researchers to apply. When I say 98%, and the only one I'm not sure about is personality, there's a couple saying that personality can be changed, and therefore, and I just don't know how to categorize that in that paragraph. 
And I think maybe I could even do that. And then I can say 100%. Um, yeah, when you have your eyes, when you know why and you have your eyes on it, you're still going to have to learn how. You know the why. And my book, A Liberated Mind, walks through it. But if you don't want to do that, there's other books out there. Google Psychological Flexibility, Acceptance and Commitment to Therapy. Um, or just follow all of the third wave, so-called, of CBT, all the evidence-based therapies that are process-focused out there, the DBT, compassion-focused therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, those fruit nut seed mix of things out there that once you look in a process way, will take it down. But then you're going to have to learn how. Fortunately, you can start now, and they're tiny little things. I gave you an example. Sing your thoughts. And I quickly mentioned there's a couple others, and you can go in a 15-minute video and see 12 of them. Uh, you did free, just Google my name and TEDx, and you'll find the two. Um, I think I well, that one was called Mental Breaks, Void Mental Breaks. And the first break was like putting on a brake in a car, and the second break was like something being broken. But uh, you can go and get free resources. And let me give you an example. The World Health Organization has an ACT self-help book. If you get it, it's very short, very thick, it's free, very thin, it's, very, it's free. Uh, you'll have to read really close to find that it has, in fact, it, ACT isn't even in there. There's one mention of the author, Russ Harris who's a well-known act popularizer in Australia, a physician there. And when WHO came to me uh, eight, nine years ago and said, victims of war, everything bad happens. We can't just think of them in terms of mental disorders. It's everything. What can I do? And we, I said, get them more psychologically flexible. Well, now gold-plated randomized trials later, multiple ones, big ones, huge ones with South Sudanese refugees in Uganda, Syrian refugees in Turkey and the EU, massive team now in the Ukraine from WHO, and studies showing why does it work, done properly, psychological flexibility. 50% reduction from a simple little book and uh, some social help from people who are not experts in mental health in the development of mental health disorders at a one-year follow-up. 50% from a cartoon book and an audio tape that you can get for free. Uh, well, I can, I can give you the, the link, but let me just, let me just, yes, tell you basically there in non act speak, as simple as we can make it with cartoon figures, we just talk about how to rein in the problem solving mind, be more emotionally and cognitively open focused in the now from this more spiritual or noticing sense of self and focused on your values and getting your feet moving towards them. That's a shorter version of that paragraph. And those you can learn, you can learn all those. And, and you can start for free. Go to the WHO website, download, download it. It is the single most commonly downloaded document at the World Health Organization today. So said Mark Van Overen, the head of mental health at WHO. So look, I'm not just talking bad about, hey, you know, read my book. I don't care if you read my book. Do put these flexibility skills into your life. And if you want to be a high performer, do it that way. I mean, the last, right before COVID, I mean, I was there with the Toronto, Toronto Blue Jays with the entire sports performance team, the mental performance team, who are all act all the time, and even the physical therapists and so forth. I mean, in the NBA, in, in China, I mean, I know, I watch people win gold medals in tennis who have act coaches. Look, uh, you can put it into your life. And no, you and I talking here can't give you all the techniques but I can give you more examples. And you're kind of asking me to give you an example. Can you give, I give, give you one that has to do with the hero you just picked or Please. the guide? Okay. 
you got a problem. Oh, and just for the audience, we will put everything that you talked about into the show notes. I will check with you, Stephen, so that we get that right. So the audience can, you know, calm down. They will get all, all of these um, references. Awesome. You can download the free book at WHO, for example. Uh, well, I presume most of the listeners, you know, you're interested in your physical health. You're interested in uh, performance. You're, you're interested in... in you know, being all that you can be, not necessarily in a, a gym rat or something, but, you know, you you understand that that's uh, an important part of, part of life and your mental resilience and your mental performance because you care about that and you've structured your website that way and your podcast that way. Okay. Uh, pick something in that domain that you would like to work on that's an issue for you. That's a, uh, But now take that hero that you picked not even knowing that we're going to take it here. And what I'd like you to do is simply imagine for a moment that you're with that person you picked and they're looking at you and you're looking at them and you're physically connected here. And that you have this issue that you want to work on. And before you even quickly go to how to solve it, take this little moment to remember what it's like to be you when your your critical mind is going and you why am I doing this and blah 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 and you're telling the story and this is hard and I don't like how it feels and whatever. There's something going on psychologically. Oh, I'm so busy. I don't have time. There's something. Oh, that's not me. I, oh, I will. Just categories, you know, like my son being told, you will never be able to. Now. Get in touch with that, with that problem. Remember, you've got your guide here. And go out behind the eyes of your guide and look back at yourself. We already know, because you gave me yeses, you pick somebody who can see you and accept you and can see you with kind eyes and who cares about what you care about, who is your ally and is not looking at their watch and trying to get out of their conversation. And then where you can be together in ways that fit the purposes. Well, we have a purpose here. So you're behind the eyes of the person that you picked looking at you. What does that person see in you? And don't allow your mind to give a quick answer, but kind of open up to the question. If that person would look inside you and all this chatter and all these fears and all these limits and all this history and all these things that get in the way, of this important thing that you want to do. And they would want to guide you as how to dig down to what's important, how to be yourself, how to empower yourself as a unique human being. Stay behind the eyes of that guide and look at yourself. What would that guide, that hero you pick, likely say to you? And allow something to show up. Allow a sentence or a phrase or a few words to show up. Actually do it. And then we'll come back behind your eyes. You're back in your body now. And you've been given a gift. It's a gift that was in you. The person you were thinking of is not physically here. But who they are and what they stood for and how they interacted with you gave you a flashlight toward into the darkness. It gave you a lighthouse in the distance. The reason you picked them is because they have values that you value. I can guarantee that. You look up to them. Okay, sometimes looking up means I'm below. How about looking up means I get to be pulled up? Your guide just gave you some wise advice, I would bet you. Will you receive that? as a gift. And in English, we sometimes say it this way. When we have a precious gift we're giving to someone, we say, here, your grandmother's ring, or will you accept this? It comes from an ancient use of the word acceptance that means to receive as if to receive a gift. You've been given a gift. Friends, I have a question for you. Will you accept this? 
If you're doing that, we've just covered not all of the processes, but most of the processes in the ACT model and the psychological flexibility model. And it's one of a thousand techniques. You can come up with your own. And once you get a nose for it, you'll real, realize that whether it's your monk, your coach, your teacher, it's all around you. But the cacophony has filtered out or fuzzed your ability to see what's helpful. And, to, and so sometimes you think, I just have to make myself do it. I'm going to drive myself. I'll never succeed if I don't. And part of you is saying, you can't make me. That's not the way to go into the gym. Solid way to work. Everybody. We're going to do a fight here. Really? You're not going to want to go to the gym. So did that land with you? Did you actually do it? Could I ask you that? Um, it did, Stephen. I, I, I still have to think about how exactly it landed, but I tried to do it while you were guiding me through that experience. And I mean, um, what I had pictured, it's a small thing that I want to work on, but um, I would like to use my evenings more to consume what I call meaningful media and books because I want to be a better husband, a better entrepreneur, a better person. And I have pictured how my wife sees me as a um, awesome. person that just continuously develops and tries to be better and is is uh, hopefully humble about the, the shortcomings. And that's where I meant I still need to reflect more upon it, but it gave me a rush of, I think motivation is almost the wrong word because motivation sounds so short term and, and, and so, you know, extrinsic, but it gave me some intrinsic um, motivation. Um, and you know, the whole headline for me here is, and apologies if I jump here to a conclusion, you might, you know, contradict um, um, or have a different opinion, but the headline for me is that um, if you're open to these kind of experiences, you can generate meaningful impact, um, improvement or change in your life, um, in your quote unquote mental health with likely much less impact uh, invest than what I had at least assumed I would need to put into if I tackle, um, uh, what I thought beast like act would be. Yeah. I think you could do it in small bumps and nudges. And could I ask, I know it's intrusive. You have option to say no, if you could put into a couple words. But I don't want to do violence to that sense, that sense you have that this is not just motivation, you know, like candy in front of you to grab or something. No, this is meaning. This Perfect. is yeah. reflection. That's what I mean by values. Values aren't these words that you, oh, I don't live up to my values. No, they're the things that allow us to see intrinsically in our behavior that some things are meaningful and uplifting and to say yes to that. In a step-by-step -step way, we're never going to be God's gift to anything, but we can be bigger and better and excuse me for living. You know, I'm better when, you know, I'm not great at a psychological flexibility. Ask my wife. But when she gets a little disappointed with me, I say, yeah, love, but remember how I was? And she always softens, you know, because we're on a journey together as a loving couple and God bless her. She's willing to accept me for who I am, you know, and uh, that lifts me up, that carries me forward, because I could give you a hundred reasons why I have no right even to be talking to you. I'm here because I want to make a difference. Watch the TED Talk and you'll see why. And I want to put something in the world that might be good, not to carve my name in the sky, but to serve, yeah? Would you be willing just to share just a couple words about what, well, if you were to put it into words about doing violence to what you, you saw, what would she want to, how would she want to guide you? How would those kind eyes seeing you want to be of work use to you, even with this uh, challenge you have, focusing on the meaningful media 
if you don't want to share, it's okay. But I'm ha- I'm happy to try. I'm I'm happy to try to share. Um. I think, I hope that the way that she would look at me is one where she is um, happy and appreciative about our current situation and the person that I am already. Um, So there is no need, urgency, pressure to change. At the same time, her being proud about and 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 thankful, but also on the other way, that's the reason why I could convince her to marry me. So I don't want to make it too much, you know, um, you know, centered around yeah. me. But um, you know, she being happy and, and 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 proud about that, despite there not being this pressure, um or urgency that I still want to work on improving as a, as a husband, as a father, um, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a person, but also being okay with if I fail in some of these endeavors, or if I need to take two or three attempts, um, to get it right. Awesome. I'm going to try to put it in words. So she appreciates and accepts all about you now. And then she's looking forward to the journey and she's asking you to be on that journey with her, not in this prideful, judgmental, oh, you got to write there, but, but like a good partner would, you know, and if I could put a, a word to it, she saw and said something to you that was loving just in her view of that challenge. How would we approach this incrementally in a loving way? Together, I'm putting words around it, but what you said landed with me that that way. And I think our problem-solving mind would say, that's not really motivation. Motivation has to be like, you know, if I do this, I'll make that much money. Or if I get that cattle prod to make me go to the gym, I'll get this much stronger. (sighs) You know, just watch professional athletes explode around that kind of motivation. You know, something like 20% of the professional ball players over a two or three year period will be in rehab and they'll, they'll have thoughts like I'll never be able to play again. They're just an instant away from an injury. My dad was played semi-pro ball and was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds and threw out his arm, throwing a club triple header, foolishly thinking at the age 19 that he was king of the world because he could throw no hitters in high school. And he lived his life as a tragedy. I could have been a major league ball player. Ball players are one instant away from everything being gone. We all know it. How can you possibly do that? Well, could, the way we normally do it is we've got to have to whip ourselves into shape. Or there's a kinder, more loving way to do it. You know, creating that safety net. Very often. The new injuries happen. You may have a way back, but not if you're banging yourself about the heads and ears. So, you know, I was moved by the description. I'm, I think you were moved by the seeing that. Yeah, it's in you, of course. She wasn't here. But that means you're carrying her love with you right now. Everybody listening, some people have not had much, but they're carrying these seeds, almost everybody who did. What I asked, you know, you've got the seeds of your prosperity in you right now. Don't mean that you're, that doesn't mean you're an island. It means even using those skills to connect with others. That's the social part I said needs more emphasis. It's a beautiful example and thank you for sharing it. And I think if you unpack that experience, you'll find the psychological flexibility processes are all over it. So maybe there's a kinder way forward that will actually be more successful. Even if you want to be a professional athlete, or if you want to, you know, be an entrepreneur, or if you want to be a good husband or a good dad, or maybe just do a good job with your time in the gym. Even that, 
was a wonderful ending to a very deep conversation that I uh, really want to thank you for. Is there anywhere specifically, in addition to what you already mentioned, which we will put into the show notes, where you want to guide our listeners either to learn more about yourself um, or any other topic that you want to highlight? Well, of course, you can uh, follow me on various kinds of social media, but you can go to my website, stephenchays.com. It says, yes, please send it to me. I'll send you a little description of ACT. I'll put you in my newsletter list. I don't spam people. It's a one-click opt-out. But also, I would say, you know, look more broadly. That's what's all around you. And now that you've heard some of these words like ACT, psychological flexibility, third wave, CBT, process-based approaches, you'll start seeing them. It's like when you want to buy a car, you start noticing that cars around you on the road, you're going to see it in the media streams. It's around you. And when you start walking down this road, uh, you, you'll find more and more supports. Um, and once that happens, let your experience be your guide. Even an old bald man shouldn't be believed uh, without your experience being the guide. And so um, you can trust your experience. Now, we just did an example by your experience of having guides that you look up to, and right in there is the model. So, uh, yeah, those are some ways that you can get to it. And uh, I hope what I've been able to say here is useful to the, to the listeners. And thanks for the opportunity. And kind of just say the reason we had a deep conversation here, and I think it kind of felt meaningful and useful is because you structured it and thank you for your work and what you're trying to put in the world. I appreciate and that. Wife who appreciates Jeepin. it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to the show. I would love to get your comments, suggestions, and feedback. Also, if there's a special topic you would like me to address or someone specific you'd love to see on the show. If you want to support me, please hit the subscribe button and leave me a rating. I hope you will listen in again on the next show. Until then, all the best.